I want to jump into this part two here because I cannot wait. Since last Sunday, I didn't get to finish this word, and I'm going to just start where we left off, and we're just going to keep rolling. So uh, let me kind of tell you where to turn. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And the series we started last week is entitled Interpreting Doors. Interpreting Doors. And I called it that because... I think, and it might sound like kind of a unique title, but uh, whether we realize it or not, we're constantly confronting doors in our life. A door is, you know, I was studying in the Bible different places where doors were mentioned, and a lot of times uh, the scripture talks about thresholds. Have you ever read, especially in New King James, King James, they use the word threshold, and they're talking about the threshold of a doorway. And a lot of times that word threshold is talking about going from one season, one room, or like with the temple, you are in a common place. Once you pass the door or go through, pass the threshold or go through the door, you are now entering a different atmosphere. The thresholds of the temple is what the Bible talks about. And so when we're thinking of doors, I want you to kind of see it in a prophetic sense, if you will, that the doors in our life represents Uh, represent entrances to different seasons or paradigms, if you will, paradigms. So when you're in a room and you walk through a door, that door represents uh, going from one place to another place. Now, that's super deep, right? A door, right? But if you think of it spiritually, you can be in a season of life, a place, a level, if you will. There's limitations, there's temperature. Every room has a different uh, culture and atmosphere. Every season's different. But when you go through an open door, you are leaving something behind and you're embracing an entirely new atmosphere, season, or paradigm. And so this is a prophetic uh, angle that I wanna go from today. And as we get started, I I was uh, looking in Scripture, notice that 38, listen to this, 38 of the 40 recorded miracles of Jesus happened through him speaking words. So a lot of times we like to think that every time Jesus did a miracle, he was just laying hands. Now, sometimes he laid hands and spoke a word, but almost every one, 38 out of 40, Jesus spoke healing and delivered it through words. And I think that's important because a lot of times we can overvalue and overemphasize uh, experience, feelings, moments, right? That, you know, like, wow, in church, if you grew up in church, you're like, man, there's, you remember these powerful moments where, man, worship was so anointed, or I just, I felt the presence of God, or man, I just, God just touched me here. All that's great. But if you try to live on spiritual feelings, like that's like living on mountaintops, then you'll be disillusioned quickly because you'll realize that your walk with God is not from mountaintop to mountaintop because when you're going to the next mountain, you go down this mountain, you leave that one behind, you're in a valley. By the way, the valley is where the fertile ground is, where everything grows, by the way, and you sow in the valley and you reap in the valley, not on the mountaintop. So if you stayed on mountaintops all the time, you would starve, right? Right? Because why? Because you're just happy and you have goosebumps and it's amazing, but you don't realize that there's a time for everything. And you might be in a valley season and God's saying, this is where you're supposed to sow because this is where the harvest will be. So don't complain that you're not on the mountaintop that's behind you. And you're like, man, those were good days. I wish we could go back to that. I feel that way about the 80s sometimes. I think it was the greatest decade. And uh, the church, I feel like, I mean, worship was definitely the best in the 80s of any time in history. If you don't know that, look up Ron Cannoli later, and uh, you'll realize how anointed worship was. But anyways, and so we can, you know, people always like to dwell on the past. You know, you know that guy that, you know, was the quarterback in, foot, uh, in high school and never got over that moment? Like, he's never accomplished anything else, but man, he remembers. I was the guy in high school, right? And he's not the guy when he gets out of high school, right? So you You can live on the mountaintops behind you in your mind, but you are not there anymore. You're going forward. Paul says, I forget what lies behind. I don't have time to overthink everything. I have to keep moving forward. So valley seasons are the most fertile time of your life when you get the most harvest and you sow the most seed. So don't neglect when you don't feel it. Mountaintops have beautiful views. The air is fresh. It's amazing. I mean, that's where the goosebumps are, but you'll not always feel that experience but your faith is what carries you and not your feelings. 
so you don't have to be moved by feelings. And so uh, Jesus released his word and his healing or his power was traveling through his words. So as I'm preaching today, he gives us an example of speaking his word and releasing power. And it's important for you to comprehend, or let me say it like this, apprehend his word every day. I think comprehend is understanding, but apprehend that you have a part to play. You have to, on purpose, offensively, pursue the word of the Lord, right? What are we doing? We have a Bible reading challenge. I'm not going to say who's missed days, because I'm sure everyone's missed days, but we're reading the New Testament in a year at Life's Church, and I challenged you with that to keep God's word before you, because when you apprehend his word, his power is delivered through that word. And so if you're trying to get spoon-fed miracles from somebody else. Man, I just got to get around the man of God. And it's funny because we were talking about, you know, uh, we grew up in different denominations and different types of churches, but uh, at the, until this season, and of course, I mean, including this season, Courtney and I come from a non, non-denominational background, spirit-filled churches, and I've been to churches where, I mean, we had tambourines, we blow shofars, we did it all, but I've also been to Methodist churches and Baptist churches too. Uh, but you learn, though, in these seasons, the importance, you know, it's like the power of God. A lot of times we um, think that that power looks a certain way, but we don't realize that God might be delivering the miracle that you need in a package you don't expect. Or let me say it like this. Your miracle might be delivered in a package you don't appreciate. Jesus came as a baby. Who would have ever guessed God, oh, God's going to visit earth. Yeah, he's coming to the earth in the flesh, and he's going to conquer. Now, we all, and you would have done it too, so don't just get mad at the disciples or Israel, but they all got confused and say, wait a second, he doesn't look very conquering. I mean, he's being spit on. He's got a crown of thorns. He's, I mean, everyone hates him. Like, I thought we were going to kill everybody and take over the world, and so the packaging wasn't in accordance to the expectation. Let me say, Almost all the time, the packaging that God sends what you need will not be according to what you expect. So don't devalue the delivery system. You might think, I don't like the way pastor does things or whatever, but you know what? If God's using me to deliver something, it doesn't matter if it... I have had... There has been Sundays, I'll just be a little transparent, where I've been like, I'm quitting. It's the worst sermon I've ever preached. It's not anointed. I'm a terrible preacher. I'm like, babe, I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I think God does that. I heard Keith Moore say this one time. God t- uh, was teaching about grace. And, and he says, do you, and he said, Lord, teach me about your grace. He goes, all right, I'm going to show you what my grace looks like. And that was uh, during that week. And then on that Sunday, he's a pastor. Uh, and he got it. He was fine. He had his great sermon. And as he was walking up the steps to the stage to preach, all of a sudden, he forgot everything that he was going to teach. He looked at his notes, and it looked like somebody else wrote them. It could have been in another language for all he cared. And he said he couldn't even put two coherent sentences together in front of the congregation that was being broadcast around the world. Can you imagine what heaven was doing right then? They're like, watch this. He wants to learn grace. We're going to show him what my grace looks like. And he's just looking in the cameras and couldn't say anything. And then, of course, God, thank God he didn't let it go on for two hours. But he, and all of a sudden, that presence came back on him, and he just began to deliver the word of the Lord, one of the most powerful services they ever said, ever had. And he said, I learned the grace of God at that moment. The grace of God is not something that's added to you to make you better. The grace of God needs to replace you and does everything through you and for you. It, God's not a partner with you. It's funny that we like to say, I'm a partner with God, and it sounds really cool, but it's not true right? Like he's in charge and says and does everything. And all you do is carry out what he says. It's not like we make decisions together, me and God, we just kind of talk about it. No, God's grace is sufficient. When you're weak, his grace is strong. Not when you're sort of weak, but have a little strength. God says, no, if you're doing it, I won't do it. So we have to humble ourselves and let him do it. So I want you to apprehend this word today because it's prophetic and I'm delivering the word of the Lord. So this is how power is being released. Don't just wait for me to walk out there and slap you on the forehead and put a oil on you because that's great, but this is how God chooses the most to release power. Now, last week we talked about this new year we entered in in September. And the September is the 15th was the beginning of the Hebraic calendar, the new year, 5784. And last week we talked about the year of the door. The year of the door. And this is a prophetic unction that, This next year, the year that we're in, but even with 2024 coming up, 
We are going into a year where I believe God has doors in our lives that have been locked for many seasons. And if you can understand what I'm teaching today and this last week, then you will know how to prepare yourself for him to unlock and open the door that no one can shut. Let me read it to you in uh, Revelation. Let's read Revelations here. And I'm going to move quickly because I want to get to everything here today. And last week I had a long intro, so I'm almost done. This is the last thing we'll read, and then I'm going to get to the points. All right, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read uh, verses 7 and 8. He says, uh, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy. Now, do you know who we're talking about here? Who is he who is holy? It's in red, so who's speaking? Jesus is speaking. Okay, so Jesus is talking to the church, and that's not Philadelphia in America. That's Philadelphia, ancient Philadelphia. Okay, so he's, Jesus is talking to a church now. I want you to hear this. To a local church. He who is holy and he who is true. He who has the key of David. So who has the key of David? Jesus does. Okay, so this is important for you to get. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. He says, I know your works, and I have set before you a what? Open door. So Jesus has the keys. He's the only one that can open, right? And no one can shut once he opens the door. But he also says, if I close the door, you can fight it all you want. You can get armies. Other people can fight. It doesn't matter. No one can open it unless I do. And last week, we start off by saying that if Jesus has a key, he's the only one that can open, the only one that can close, then don't be frustrated if you want a door open and it's not opening in your life. Now, I'm talking about a door of opportunity, a door of a new season, whatever that step is. If it's not open, you don't need to worry about getting the door open. All we're going to learn today is we need to make sure that we are out of the way so that he can open doors that he wants to open. So is this door supposed to open ever is a question, right? Closed doors mean three different things. It could be uh, wrong way, wrong time, or wrong attitude. I mentioned that last week. Wrong way, like you're not meant to go that path. That's for somebody else. You don't, you're, it's never going to open for you, so go ahead and give up on that. But Lord, right, I want that job. I want to move to that city. I want to marry that person. I want to do that. If that's your will, then God's not going to open the door and bless it. Now, you can try to force it all you want, but it will never work because you can't open it. So that's wrong way. Wrong time is, yes, this is my will, but you're out of time. There's a appointed time for everything, a time and a season. God says, not yet. Timing. So trust him with that. But also, you can have wrong time, you can have wrong way, and then wrong attitude means something has to change in you. The children of Israel took 40 years to make an 11-day journey. You can walk 11 days and get to the promised land from Egypt. And it took them 40 years. Why? Wrong attitude, right? The timing was got, if they would have had the right attitude, it would have taken 11 days and one second. They would have walked right in and God would have started. But because they had the wrong, so the right timing, God was ready for it, right? Right way, it was what God had promised them. But wrong attitude means the door would not open until they're ready for it. And they had to learn a lot of lessons that weren't easy in that time. So when you go through a door, it's like a new paradigm. It's like fishing. One of my favorite things to do now is fishing. Uh, the boys and I uh, like to go fishing together. We went on Friday, actually, to uh, Possum Kingdom Lake. Uh, we had a pro bass fisherman take us out on his boat and teach us about uh, bass fishing and lake fishing. And I learned so much. If you really want to know the secrets that a pro bass fisherman has, I don't know why you can't Google it. I've already thought I learned everything about fishing because I'm a reader. I'm like, I want to know all about it. He told me, do you know the direction the wind blows is, is totally affects how much fish you're going to catch? Did you know that? Don't, you didn't know that. Are you a pro? Really? You did? Okay. I didn't know that. I couldn't find it anywhere. I mean, so like when the wind is coming from the west, of just one little deal for those who like to fish, west wind is the best time to fish. I'm not going to tell you about the other three. You'll have to just find your own pro bass fisherman. Okay, so well, we went fishing. I love fishing, but uh, whenever um, uh, Courtney's dad, uh, we went to visit in the Cajun part of Louisiana, and uh, what's the name of that city? I just, Therio. Oh, Therio, like T-H-E-R-I-O-T. You know it's Cajun when there's like silent letters everywhere. It's like Papado, Therio, Boudreaux, right? So we are in Cajunville. Like, I mean, like, 
I felt like we were on like Swamp People. Like it was like, I mean, it looked like the show. And I was like, now if you love fishing, this is like heaven for me. I was like, if there's anyone that knows how to fish, it's Cajuns in South Louisiana. I mean, because they have freshwater lakes everywhere and they have salt water, they have brackish water. These boys know what they're doing and they can cook and they can fish. Never challenge and survive, by the way, too. Like we could lose all electricity. The whole world ends. The Cajuns will be just, they won't even know. They're like, what? We lost electricity? I mean, these people are amazing. So I went to visit uh, and her dad and so, and her stepmother is, I mean, speaks French, like real deal. Like, man, that she can cook too. Ah, oh, bless her. Okay, so we're going, man, we're going there for Thanksgiving next year. I, anyways, so uh, we went to this Terrio, Louisiana, and we go fishing. And what did I say? Terrio. That's what I said. Terrio, Louisiana. Silent H, I guess. But, uh, and so he takes his uh, redfish fishing. And he said, let me just warn you, it's not the season for it. So we might catch a few that aren't smart and never made it out to the sea or kind of got lost or whatever. Or maybe they're just crazy. But uh, most likely, there won't be a lot of redfish because it's not the time. We missed, we were after the season for them. And what happens is, is when the, uh, when the air gets cooler and the water temperature goes down in the fall and then into the late fall, all the redfish come in from the bay and in from the ocean and they come in to spawn and to lay eggs and, and, and to reproduce. So you have to, if you're in the Bay Area, you want to go in the fall in Louisiana, a little tip for you, because they're all in the shallow water, and man, you can, it's funny, because we cast, I don't know how many we caught on that trip, but I mean, he still, he knows what he's doing, so even if there's five of them in 100 square miles, he's going to find them, and I think we caught like six of them, right? And I was like, wow, like, I mean, if you're used to fishing in the lake, you know, and you're getting bass that are pounds and a half, and all of a sudden you pull in six redfish that start at two pounds and go to six pounds, you're like, hey, like, this was a great day. And he was frustrated the whole time. He's like, I told you, this is terrible. I'm like, we just caught a four-pound redfish. Like, I'm fine. He's like, no, this is the worst fishing, uh, but I wanted to take y'all at least and let you know. But if you go at the right season, every cast you're pulling in, bull redfish, uh, and if you've never eaten a redfish, you're missing out, okay? I mean, it's the best fish, I think. And every cast, you're, and he showed us pictures where they lined up. It's crazy. to I mean, like 50 of them on a table there, and they have a feast. And I'm like, okay, next time we're going at the right season. What am I trying to say? It's like an entirely different atmosphere. Every, all the results change when you're in the right moment. You can go out of season and have the same lures, the same fishing pole, wear the same shirt. You can be in the same boat, say the same words, do everything perfectly like whenever you caught them last time. But if you're not there at the season that they're in, then you will cast and miss, cast and miss, and you will be frustrated. When you're in season, you can close your eyes, throw it behind you, cast, you're catching them. You could do it through your legs and catch them. You could probably throw an empty hook and catch them. Why? Because it's the moment. It's called Kairos season. It's when God says now is the time and everything works. Why? Because every door opens when it's time. God says now it's time, walk. And you can walk on a red carpet through every door that no one could get through for many generations. Why? Because God says now, then you know he's going to open the doors. So I like to call it a paradigm shift. I love that statement, a paradigm shift. It's when everything changes around you. So I want to talk about the language of doors here for the next probably 15 minutes. And I want you to understand how to interpret doors in your life so that, because a lot of times you're wanting God to speak, but if God has already spoken, he's not going to say something new until what he said previously is received, right? Right? It's kind of like if I were to, if a parent were to say to their children, like, hey, uh, I want you to take the trash out and go outside and take the trash. And they don't do it, and you watch them. They immediately go upstairs and start playing games. They come back down, and then they start asking you, hey, uh, where we, can we do something tonight for dinner? Can I go hang out with my friends? Can I do something? Uh, I don't know about you, but any good parent that has any sense is not going to go, yeah, sure, do whatever. You're going to go, wait a second. Did you take the trash out? What? I didn't hear you say that. Yeah, take the trash out. Oh, well, can I do it later? I don't want to do it right now. No. Well, can I go hang out with my friends tomorrow? I'm not talking to you or telling you anything until you do what I told you to do last because I have a reason for everything I'm telling you, right? As a parent, you can see a bigger picture. God is a good father, or the song says, good, good father. So he loves us, and because he loves us, he's going to say it, and then he's going to wait till you receive it before he says the next thing. 
So if it seems that God's being silent, then don't say, why aren't you talking, God, and pray harder. You need to go back and say, God, wait a second. If I'm not hearing what I'm asking for here, am I missing something, Lord? Lord, did I, did I forget something? Lord, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? Then he'll repeat it and go, oh, well, I said, take the trash out, daughter, son. Just trust me with that. I'll take care of the rest. Just do what I told you to do. So when you do it in that way, he's being silent, but maybe he's speaking through his actions, right, more than repeating himself every five minutes. Like if there's a closed door and you keep hitting your head on it, then you need to learn to interpret that and go, wait a second, this is frustrating, and he's not the author of confusion, and I'm confused, and I'm frustrated, and I don't understand. God's not the one confusing. So if you're confused and frustrated, then we step back and we interpret that locked door as, Lord, what is it? And I'm going to give you three points in a moment that's going to explain how to interpret these things. Go to Numbers chapter 22, and I'm going to read this quickly because I have quite a few verses here. I was going to have uh, some youth act it out, but I'm going to be on time today, so just picture them acting this out while I'm reading it, okay? So in Numbers chapter 22, we're going to read about Balaam. How many of you have heard of Balaam in the scripture before? Balaam, anyone heard of Balaam? You know the story? Balak, you know who Balak is in the scripture? Okay, you can Google that and do a Wikipedia search while I'm reading here, and you can see the whole history of Balaam and Balak. But Balaam is a prophet of God, but he's not a good prophet. He is uh, selfish, self-centered, and easily swayed and moved by materialism. Even though he's a prophet of God, he has a flesh, Every man and woman of God still has a flesh that they have to carry around. It's not until we die, go to heaven, get a new body that we're without a body of sin. Paul said it in Romans 6. He goes, I got to carry around this body, this old man. Even though I'm a new creation, I still have members. My body still fights me. Wouldn't you agree with that? Like, have you ever tried to get up early and spend time with Jesus and your body was fighting that spiritual act? It's like, no, I've never been more tired in my life until the first day I decided in January 1, I'm going to spend five minutes extra every morning with God, and your body, all of a sudden your throat hurts, you're going deaf, you can't see anything, your legs, and you're like, I've never had all these issues before. Your body is fighting it. Why? Because your flesh and your spirit are at war, Galatians 5 says. So you can't tolerate your flesh. You have to crucify it. That means you don't get what you want. I'm going to do the opposite. Oh, you're tired? We're going to get up earlier. Oh, you're hungry on this fast, this one-week fast? I've never been more hungry in my life than when I'm on a fast. Anyone can attest to that? Why? Because your flesh fights it. The first two or three days is the hardest. Once you get past that, why does that happen? Everybody has all these scientific explanations. It's not. It's because your flesh realizes, I'm not going to win. I gave every shot I could, and they're still on the fast. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. That's when the miracles begin to take place. So Numbers chapter 22, verse 1. Now, I'm going to skip around. I'll tell you. So as you're reading with me, you can read on the screens. I'm not going to read the whole chapter because I want to save time here. But verse 1 says, Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, here's your backstory. This story occurs at the end of the 40 years of Israel wandering in the desert. So 11-day journey. It's taken them 40 years, they're going in circles, and they still haven't entered the promised land that they should have 39 years and 349 days, right? I mean, they're still off. Why? They're going in circles because they haven't learned what they need to learn yet. So we're at the very end of this 40 years. Moses is still alive. It's right before the death of Moses, and they're about to cross the Jordan with Joshua. When Moses dies, Joshua's going to take them across the Jordan into Jericho, and they've been wandering in the desert, and they're between, now I want you to hear what I'm about to say, they are between two seasons. They are between the end of the desert season and the beginning of the promised land season. We're, so what is the door? You're leaving and going into a new one. So Israel is at the very end of this 40 years of going in circles. Thank God. They're about to step into the promised land. So when I say season, I want you to think of paradigm. Everything is about to change when they cross this Jordan. What they ate is changing. No more manna and quail. Why? Because it's a new season. The atmosphere, everything's new paradigm shift. We're not going to eat the same. All the clothes we've worn for 40 years, the same clothes, right? They don't wear out. We're not going to wear these clothes anymore in the new season. Why? Because you can't take the previous season into the new season. 
Everything changed. Paradigm shift. So now as we read, I want you to have that in your mind. And it says, Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all of Israel had done to the Amorites. And, Moab, and, and Balak was the king of the Moabites, by the way. So Balak is the king of the Moabites. He sees Israel getting close to his land. He's, he's in the land of Canaan, and he's like, uh-oh. I got a problem here. I got to get rid of these people before we go to war because uh, this isn't going to be good. So he's now trying to figure out how to stop them. Balaam is the most famous, and he's not uh, Israelite. Balaam is a Gentile prophet, one of the most famous prophets in the world. And so verse three, it says, Moab was exceedingly afraid of these people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Go to verse five. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor. Now this is the famous prophet Balaam, which is near the river. He's now living near the river Euphrates. Man, there's a lot of significance here, but I don't have time. He lives near the river Euphrates in the land of the sons of his people. And in verse five says, he called him saying, look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and they're settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they're too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he who you curse, who you curse is cursed. He says, Balaam, I know you're a prophet of God, and if you bless them, they'll be blessed. If you curse them, they'll be cursed. So come and curse them for me. And then he sends to uh, Balaam, we're going to skip down a little bit, and he asks him to do all these things. And then... um, Let's go to, so let's just read verse seven. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hands. So they have money now, diviner's fee. And they're going, hey, we're gonna go pay Balaam to go ahead and do what he does to figure this out and to curse these people. They showed up to Balaam, verse eight, and he said to them, and they asked him what the king said. And then verse eight, he said, lodge here, stay here tonight, and I will bring back a word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam in verse nine and said, who are these men with you? When God asks you a question, he doesn't need to know the answer. He's asking you a question for you. You know, like, where are you, Adam and Eve? Like, God knew what, he watched the whole thing take place. When God asks you a question, he's like, you need to learn something, I know. Did you eat your dinner, son, right? It's like, that means you didn't eat and I want you to eat, right? Okay, so he goes on and says, look, uh, verse 11. uh, um, So Balak begins to tell him, hey, they came to me. Verse 11, they said, look, uh, these people came out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth. He said, come and curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go. Say not go. Okay, so God does not mix mincing words. It's very clear. He goes, hey, don't go with them. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So God says, look, he wants you to curse them. You're not going to curse them because they're blessed. There's something called the doctrine of Balaam that we see throughout Scripture, many times in Scripture. Do you know Balaam is mentioned more in the Bible than Noah? We talk about Noah a lot. He's a central figure. Balaam is discussed not only more than Noah in Scripture, but also not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament multiple times. They're talking about Balaam. So I would I think that we should pay attention to this Balaam Gentile prophet and find out what God is trying to teach us that he talks about Balaam more than Noah and many other people in scripture. What is it? The book of Revelation chapter two talks about, you can read it later, the doctrine of Balaam. And the doctrine of Balaam uh, is very simple. As we begin to read later, and I'm gonna jump ahead for sake of time, we realize that Balaam learned something, that you can't curse what God has blessed. It's impossible how many of you believe, if you're, how many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? He's your Savior. He's your Lord. Okay. I'm going to do an altar call for those that didn't. Okay. So a few of you, we're going to pray later. Okay. So if you're serving Jesus, and guess what? You are blessed, not because of your works, but because of who he is, what he did, and the price he paid at the cross. So Jesus made you blessed because of his sacrifice. So if you serve Jesus and believe in him, then guess what? You are blessed. Now, you might not always feel like it, but you're blessed. So how many of you are blessed? Raise your hand. Okay, you're gonna learn something here. It's impossible for a curse to be put on somebody who God has blessed. So the devil can't do anything in your life force a curse, bring destruction in your life, unless you permit him. He has no way to bring his curse and displace the blessing of God in your life. 
The only power he has is deception because just like Adam and Eve, he couldn't forcefully take the earth from them that God gave him, but he deceived them into forfeiting the earth to him. So Satan, if the only way he can bring destruction and his curse into your life is for you to open the door and allow him to steal, kill, and destroy, then how do you think he's attacking you most of the time? He's trying to deceive you in every season. God didn't say that. You should be better off than this. God should have helped you from that. This shouldn't, you shouldn't be there any longer. Why is this confusion, confusion, deception, deception? Why? To eventually you go, I don't know. Here, here's the keys. Fix it. Then he knows he's won. He can't curse what God has blessed. You have to activate a curse in your life, but it can never be put on you. So we're going to go to verse 16. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly and do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come and curse this people for me. And Balaam answered and said to the servants, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not, verse 18, I could not. He didn't say, I would not. This is very important because you're going to see his heart. He said, I can't. I want to because I want your house with silver and gold and all the blessings, but I can't because they're blessed of God. So I can't put a curse on. I can't speak a curse over them. I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Verse 19. Now, therefore, please you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. You see a heart there? He's like, I can't do it. God's already said, don't go with them. You can't curse them. They're blessed. And then they go, what did God say? And he said, hey, even if he gives me everything, I can't, I could not curse them. But hang on, let me, let me pray a little bit more. Y'all stay another night and let me just try to figure this out. Why? Because he's gonna work a way around this somehow. He's like, I'm gonna go back and talk to God. I gotta get this money. I'm gonna make this happen. God was clear enough. So now Balaam goes back, same thing happens, verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. Why? Because Balaam arose in the morning and went with him. So now God's like, I told you not to go. You wouldn't listen to me, so go ahead and go. Because right before that, God says, fine, go. And you're like, well, God told him to go, and he told him not to go. Why? Because God will tell you his will, but you have a will that he will not cross or break. Why? He gave you free will. So God's like, That's my way, that's not my way. I set before you life and death, therefore choose life and not death. But he didn't say, here's life and death, you have to go to life, you choose. And guess what? God will let you walk right away. You can turn your back and reject him all that you want. So Balaam was so adamant about going. God knew his heart, he's already gonna go. Verse 22, he was mad because he went and the angel of the Lord took his hand in the way, excuse me, took his stand in the way, verse 22, and an adversary against him. He was riding his donkey. So Balaam's on the donkey following these guys. He's like, we're gonna figure it out when we get there. I don't know, we're just gonna make it happen. And it says, all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord stood in front of him and his donkey. He was riding his donkey and his two servants were with him. Verse 23, 22. 23. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he had his sword drawn in his hand. The donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. So Balaam didn't see the angel of the Lord with a sword of fire in her hand. The donkey had more spiritual perception than the greatest prophet, Gentile prophet in the world at this moment. He has heard God's voice over and over and has prophesied over nations and they've come to pass to where the whole world without internet had heard about him because of the accuracy of his prophecies. And something, an attitude, a heart wasn't right in him and he totally lost all perception. Adam and Eve walked with God, they sinned, they could not see God anymore. It says they heard God walking in the into the garden, but they couldn't see him. Why? They lost their spiritual eyes because they fell into a lower nature. So as soon as you go your way and have your will and choose that over God's will, you are making your ear dull and your eye blind to what God is saying and doing in your life. So he, the donkey saw, and he just thought, wait a second, we're, we got to get down here. There's a lot of money on the other side of this. I, I know God. I'm going to work this out. He's going to, we'll, we'll do a partial curse, or maybe I'll curse him, but then it won't really happen. Then we'll bless him before they pay me, and then I'll bless him. They won't know, and I'll, you know, everybody wins, right? Have you ever tried to negotiate with God? You're like, Lord, if you do this, I'll do this, Lord. I promise if you give me a million dollars, I will give to the building fund because I will further your king. God, if you do this, I will serve you the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. It's, God is not, we're not gambling with him. So if God said it, 
He's going to wait until you take that step. So Balaam's arguing with God. His donkey sees an angel standing in the pathway with a sword of fire in his hand, and he turns aside, and Balaam starts beating the donkey. Pow! Get back on track. Come on, we got somewhere to go. The donkey's freaking out, going. And donkeys, if you don't know much about them, if you know horses, they have attitudes. They're very stubborn. And if you ever want, like, to protect your flock, just get a donkey. They'll kill, you know, wolves, and they'll kill coyote. I mean, they're mean, stubborn animals. So this donkey is not going to back down, and it keeps moving out of the way. He keeps hitting the donkey. Verse 25, and when the, uh, verse 24 says he is now between two walls. The donkey can't go anywhere else. The angel is standing before him, and the donkey just stops. Verse 25, when he saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he struck her again. She's like, I can't go forward, so I'm going to go sideways. And she broke his foot or crushed it against the wall. Then he gets mad, starts hitting her again. Verse 25, the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there's no way. So this keeps happening over and over. I mean, imagine like he's already irritated. Now he's really freaking out here. And he keeps hitting the donkey. And then in verse um, 20, 31, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. He bowed his head and fell flat on his face. So God said, you're not seeing it. Oh, and earlier, I'm I'm skipping for time. The donkey's mouth was open. God opened the donkey's mouth to talk to him because he was so dull, he couldn't hear God. So the donkey's like, hey, there's an angel in front of us, and I can't go forward, dude. Quit hitting me. Can you imagine that? If your car talked to you or something. So his transportation vehicle starts talking to him like, if you hit me again, I'll bite your leg off because I can't go forward, and I'm tired of your attitude, right? So now God opens his eyes, and he goes, oh, didn't see that. I'm the prophet, I should have seen that. And then he says, verse 33, the donkey saw me, God's saying, and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have already killed you by now and let her live. Wouldn't you like God to tell you that in prayer? Lord, I'm just spending time with Jesus. Yeah, I would have killed you if it wasn't for that person over there or that over there. He is, he's out of the will of God is what God's saying. Thank God for Jesus, right? And so he's like, I would have already killed you by now. So Balaam, he's got his attention. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I did not know you stood in the way, verse 34, against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with me, but only the word that I speak to you shall speak. And so he took Balaam there and he said, and Balaam said, okay, what am I supposed to say? And God says, go bless him in front of Balak. And he's like, okay, I bless, pronounced a blessing three times. Balaam pronounced a blessing on the people whom God had blessed because he couldn't curse them. Balak got so mad. He's like, I didn't bring you out here to bless them. You're doing the opposite and messing everything up. And he said, I cannot curse them. Then the doctrine of Balaam Balaam comes in. What did he do? He said, since I can't curse them, we need to deceive them into sin. Because if I can get them to follow the way of sin, I can get them out of the covering of God and they can take the curse and apply it to themselves. So he caused Israel to sin against the Lord, the Bible says. And because he deceived them, he said, Balak, here's how you're going to set them up in a trap. This is their temptations. This is what you can do. He said, they fell into sin. And the Bible says the doctrine of Balaam is where Balaam helped Balak deceive God's people into living a life of sin, that it's okay, not a big deal. Just go this way a little bit. Just dabble, have one foot on the fence and one foot on the other side. Doesn't matter. Receive that. And because of that, they took a curse and they activated it in their own lives. So the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation, Jesus is telling one of the churches, he says, I have something against you. You have those of the doctrine of Balaam in your household. And they are saying to others that this is okay, this rebellion in the Lord, sin in our lives, compromise. And he says, they are now bringing a curse on my people Get that spirit of Balaam out of the church. Get it out of your life. Let me say not church, out of your life. Where is the spirit of Balaam trying to come into your life and bring a curse into your hand for you to look at and go, wow, that looks pretty good. And you settle for a temporary materialistic curse that you think is a blessing and you forfeit the blessing of God, the path of God in your life. This is not the generation to play around with sin. And I'm not, I'm not one to just get up here every Sunday and be like, hell is hot, you need to get saved. That's not what I'm doing here. But I'm gonna tell you something. We're in the last days. God's wrapping everything up. And the worst thing that you can do is be compromised and lukewarm. When the line is being drawn, Satan is ramping up. The kingdom of God is getting brighter. Darkness is getting darker. You cannot ride a fence any longer. 
I didn't mean you have to be perfect and never have a temptation come to your way, but you can't tolerate repetitive disobedience in your life because you follow the way of Balaam, the Bible says, which means Balaam was a prophet of God who valued the things of this world and sin more than the blessing of God. And he taught, he was an example to others to do the same thing. So I want you to see some. God stopped Balaam in his tracks. And here's what I want you to see. We're gonna learn from Balaam real quick in the next couple minutes. And I want you to understand why God closed the path and taught Balaam. God could have done it a lot of different ways. So how do we understand the meaning of closed doors? Because some of us might be going the way of Balaam and not even know it, but you've been coming up against a obstacle or a block path for generations, for decades, for years, for months. And you're like, why isn't anything happening? How come I haven't advanced? Why am I still here? It could be one of three things. Number one, how do we understand closed doors? Number one, what do we learn from Balaam? God will disrupt your path to get your attention. So if you can't interpret the fact that you're hitting your head up against a brick wall, Balaam's like, why do we keep stopping here? He could not see or interpret the door that was closed because God said, hang on a second. It's not the right way, not the right time, not the right way, not the right attitude. You're going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing, and you have the wrong attitude or the wrong heart. If he would have understood how God leads, then he had already heard God's voice, but he didn't obey God's voice. And God's not going to try to explain it and go, well, it's okay if you go a little bit. But what I meant was, no, God said, don't go. You're going to go anyways. So now you're not going to hear any more instructions. You're just going to see a locked door. Interpret this. That means he will disrupt your path. He stopped in front of him. So here's the deal. Here's what I want you to catch. And don't worry. It's a couple more minutes, but this is more important than the Dallas Cowboys or your lunch. Sorry, that was harsh, but I don't want to be locked into time because the word of the Lord's coming. So let me give you a few more minutes because you need this. Oh, I need this. If you don't need it, I need this. I'm going to listen to it myself. When God stops you or disrupts your path or the progress stops in your life, he wants to meet with you. There is an appointment with God waiting when progress is stopped because you need to find out why I'm interpreting a door now. Why is nothing happening? Why won't the door open? How come I've been in the same season? Why is it so hard? Why is it never happening? I've said it, you've said it, we've all said it. Why, why, why? If you are at a locked door and asking why, then you have an appointment with God that has not been met yet. Because if you know what God's saying, then God will open doors. Every door will be open when you're in the path of God. As long as the timing's right, no door can be shut once God opens it. So we have an appointment. God, what are you saying? When your journey's disrupted, look for the angel. Ask your donkey and say, what are you seeing? Because I'm not seeing it. Does anyone else see this? Because I have no idea. Most likely, people around you have more perception, even in your season or your path than you do because they don't have the emotional weight or attachment or frustration that you've been going through. So you have to humble yourself and maybe go, and I'm not calling them donkeys, right? But you need to go to your friends or godly people or counsel or whoever it might be, a parent or a pastor or a friend, a coach, whatever, and say, hey, do you see something I'm not seeing? I can't, this is, something's wrong and I don't understand it. And be humble enough to go when they say, yeah, There's an angel in the road. You're not going the way God told you to go, and you better turn around and go that way and have the humility to say, I receive that. Why? Because you'll be able to see what God wants you to see when you humble yourself. Balaam had pride and was going his own way. He burned out. When you burn out, you keep hitting the wall. If you keep trying to go forward with a locked door, eventually you're gonna burn out, spiritually speaking, and say, well, I just, and then you're gonna find yourself, I've seen it over and over, people are away from God for a long season of life, and they might come back years later and be like, man, that was the hardest season of my life. Why did they leave? Why do you leave? A lot of times it's because there was burnout. I just got burnt out. I just got worn out. It's not that walking with Jesus burns you out. It's walking your own way will burn you out. And if I walk into a wall over and over enough, I'm gonna get tired of walking into a wall. So then you just go, I can't do this anymore, and you go the other way. But if you are walking into a wall, go to the appointment and ask the Lord why you're hitting this wall. So how do you handle closed doors? When you can't move forward, are you ready for this? Listen. How does God's power, how does he deliver it? Through his word. 
Lord, what are you saying to me? I need to be listening to what you're saying. When you're at the right door even, and it won't open, then you need to be listening to the voice behind the door. I mean, I had a great example in Naaman that I'm not gonna go into today. So when you can't move forward, what do we need to do? Listen, Lord, I have an appointment. What are you saying? Ask him what he's saying. Now, here's what I want you to see. Balaam hit this closed door, and I'm almost done here. Balaam hit this wall. He couldn't go any further. God shut the way, blocked his path, and anytime God has a closed door in front of you, if he closes the door in front of you, he's attempting to open a door inside of you. So God's saying, door in your path is closed because there's a door in your heart that's closed, and that needs to be open to me so that I can open the door in your path. Once again, when God closes a door in front of you, he's attempting to open a door inside of you. And once God opens a door in front of you, so now he's dealt with you, he opens the door in front of you, he also does something else. He closes the door behind you. All right, Lord, I'm at a locked door. What is it? Opens the door inside of you. Oh, I'm the wrong way, wrong attitude, whatever it is. God's fixing that. Now he says, okay, now I'm opening a door. As soon as you walk forward, that door locks, you're done. Don't try to go back. Don't even talk about the good old days. Just keep moving forward because time is short. We're walking through doors. So outward obstacles are an invitation for an inward change in our life. An outward obstacle is an invitation for an inward change. Why? Because something needs to change because we're at an obstacle. So when you feel that in your life and you're feeling that resistance, then you need to go, Lord, what are you saying? And something is going to change in here. Maybe it's more clarity. Maybe God reminds you of what he said last time. Maybe God says, hey, fix this right here, and I'm about to open the door. Whatever that is, we got to go through that inward change because God will allow your flesh to be frustrated in order to allow your spirit to lead. So Balaam broke his foot. The donkey kicked him. He ran into the wall. All this chaos was going on. His flesh was frustrated because his flesh was leading. And so God will say, look, you're gonna, your flesh is going to get mad whenever your flesh is leading. And as soon as you're irritated and frustrated, then you look up and say, what is it, Lord? Your flesh will have to move out of the way so your spirit can lead. Number two, how do we interpret a closed door? A closed door can mean wrong way. And that's easy. What did he say? He said, you're going the wrong way. Here's what I want you to see. Don't blame your donkey when you're not advancing because there's a closed door in front of you. What is the donkey? The vehicle. It's easy to cheapen the season you have, the thing you have, the place you are in life now because it's old, stale, boring, frustrating. I don't like this anymore. Don't devalue your transportation vehicle because it's not getting you where you want it to go. It's not the season's fault. It's not your church's fault, your job's fault, your boss's fault. It's not your spouse's fault. It's not, because we say, if anything would change out here, then it would be okay. God says, no, it's not anyone else's fault. What did he tell Balaam? He said, your, verse 32, let's read it. He said, uh, in verse 32, the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I've come to stand against you because your, what? Way is perverse before me. Your way is perverse. Come on, say my way. All right, so if you're hitting a block, he says, don't hit the donkey. It's your way that is perverse. Now, I'm not saying all of you are perverted if you're hitting a wall. Here's what I want to say. I want to say that your perspective, attitude, approach, or your way that you're going is not his way, and he will not permit an advancement. I do not want to see you. I, two years ago, we talked about the word of the Lord, about reaching the fence. God did it all in life's church. But just because I'm saying it's an open door next year does not mean everybody in here will go through open doors next year. It's up to you to go through the open door. You might see everyone else go through, but you didn't do what it takes to go through. So number three, closed doors, and I said this earlier, are appointments with God, appointments with God. When all you see is an obstacle, God wants to reveal himself in your life. What is he trying to show you? You might say, well, I didn't make the team. Some of you in school right now, or I didn't, it didn't pan out the way I thought it would happen. There might be a, a kind of a sign there that God's saying, hang on, I didn't put you where you thought you were going because I blocked that way. I have an appointment with you, and what you're going to find out when we meet is going to take you further than you thought you would be if you would have gone that way. I will take you out. You can leapfrog over a season with God and advance faster when you do it his way. So once again, God is saying, I'll take it from here. Stand up with me if you would. We are going into a season of open doors, 
And as you stand up, we're gonna close in prayer and I want you to see something. Do not allow yourself to be the reason that you're stuck where you are any longer. Some of you don't know. I wish we were all humble enough, and I'm not saying I'm the one because I don't know everybody's situation, but I wish the people in our lives that love us had the freedom to come to us and say, I'm seeing something. You're frustrated, but I see something in your life. If you would deal with that now, you would advance exponentially in this next season. God told me open doors and exponential multiplication in 2024. So at Lights Church, I am not just hoping to see it. We are going to see corporately exponential multiplication as we walk through this open door. But you can watch the church receive exponential multiplication and wish you were involved in it if you don't allow God to multiply you. So don't get past December. You've got a few more weeks left to do what you... Go to the appointment and say, God, what is it? I don't want to figure it out in January, Lord. What is it, Lord? What is the appointment that will cause this multiplication? And I'm telling you, nothing is impossible with God. You will see results. Just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. When we humble ourselves and surrender to him, he will open a door that no man can shut. I'm going to read you this last scripture, and this is the word the Lord gave me, and I took extra time because I want to, this is the meaning of this message, and the Lord said, read Isaiah 43, 16 through 21, and it is a now specific word for those that hear this sermon. This is not a cool scripture that I thought about reading. God said, these words are prophetic for the people that hear them today. So this is now a prophetic word I'm reading in Scripture directly to you by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 43, uh, 15 through 21. He says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, your Creator and your King. Thus says the Lord, listen to this, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They lie down together and they shall not rise because your enemies are extinguished and quenched like a wick. Do not remember, listen, the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now, when God says now, what happens? Every door opens, the red carpet comes out. Now it shall spring forth but shall you not know it? Are you like Balaam who can't perceive that that's not the way? This is the open door. I am opening a door. What did Jesus say in Revelation 3? I set before you an open door that no man can shut. He goes on to say, I will, here's the deal. God says in this new year, he will make a road, a path in the, in the middle of the wilderness. You're in a wilderness season. You are going to see the path that brings you through the wilderness into the promised land this year. He said, if you're in a desert season without water, verse 19, I will bring rivers in the middle of the desert. So you've been in a drought, and God says, this year I'm going to bring the abundance of rain, so much so that water gushes forth like rivers in your life, and you don't have a little bit of rain, a little water. He said, I'm going to overwhelm you with the rain in this season, if you can perceive the open door that I'm bringing before you. He said, all of the wilderness I will give waters to, rivers in the desert, I will give you drink, my chosen people, because I have formed you for myself. And in this next year, in 2024, you will declare the praise and glory of God, not by faith, but by description. I'm gonna say it again. Not by faith, but by description. What is praising God by faith? It's saying, God, you're worthy because he is worthy. Even though I don't feel it, even though nothing's happening, Lord, you're worthy and you're worthy of praise in spite of my life. But, being, but praising him by description means you're looking at what God is doing and your praise is a description of the things that are happening in real time. It's one thing to praise by faith and praise before the breakthrough. And then when the breakthrough is happening, then you say, God, thank you, Jesus, for that house. Lord, thank you for the job. Thank you for my marriage being healed. Thank you for the healing in my body, not in the future, because you're healed and you're erupting in praise because of what God is doing. So this is not a year where you will describe future events. You are going to, in real time, have breakthroughs throughout this next year that you will cannot stop but erupt in worship and praise because of what is happening every 
day. Wouldn't you like to get up and check your bank account or check this, this contract that hadn't gone through or a court order that has been against you or a blocked wall or a marriage issue or a job you've been believing for or sickness in your body and a doctor's report that has all been against you. And all of a sudden the doctor calls and goes, I don't know what happened, but you're a hundred percent free of this disease. And then your praise is now descriptive. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Wouldn't you like that door to open to where you have more than enough to give to every? How many of you would like to be completely debt-free and have hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars to give to the kingdom this year? Would you do that? Okay. You can praise God now. You have to. But you can also praise God when you're looking at the bank account. And let me tell you, it's descriptive praise is really nice. What am I teaching you with that? In worship on Sundays, let me help you with your worship. Instead of always just worshiping and singing the words to the song, Close your eyes. I don't open my eyes almost the entire time worship. A lot of times the worship team is trying to cue me like it's your time. But because I'm looking at the Lord, I'm beholding him, the beauty of his holiness. And as you look at him, you go, wow, he's holy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're beautiful. Not, Lord, you're beautiful. Lord, you're worthy. When you embrace him, you can't help but speak his praises. So instead of looking at your problem and trying to praise by faith, look at your God and worship will be a reaction. We're in a Thanksgiving season. Thanksgiving's easy whenever you're looking at the Father. Lord, if you're looking at your covenant, you can go, God, I thank you have a covenant of healing. God, thank you have a covenant of prosperity, a covenant of peace, Lord, a covenant of your blessing, God. You're so faithful because your eyes are in the right place. This is the year that you will see the harvest of many seeds sown. But you have to be willing to say, Lord, what is the appointment before December 31st that you have that has held or withheld you opening this door for many years? And once he tells you that door cannot stay shut, it will go wide open. And you're going to see it in a few months. What's going to happen here, you're going to say, some of you have been here eight years, and you're like, is it ever going to open? It's already creaking open right now. And when it happens, you're going to go, wow, God, you're amazing, because you're going to see the promises of God in the land of the living. Lord, we love you. Lord, we worship you, God. Lord, we praise you in advance, Lord. But I thank you, Lord, this is every Sunday. I, trust me. No, because we're going to do what God says. But if God, Jesus says, could you not? tarry an hour with me to the disciples. Why? Because they did not perceive or value who he really was and what he was doing. Do not let your attention and value go to temporal, temporary, useless, no eternal value treasure in your life. It's okay to do fun things and go to lunch and watch Cowboys, but do not allow yourself to get antsy when God is trying to deposit something in your heart. If you get up in the morning and spend time with God, and after five minutes you can't sit there any longer, then that is what you need to be working on. Lord, I need an appointment with you, and I will sit here until I perceive what's happening, Lord. Don't rush things. It's I'm going to take a few more minutes because I'm going to make it awkward for you because your flesh gets weird. Your flesh will start fighting it. Calm down this year. God's got it. Your anxiety happens when you try to advance before God's ready. When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Are we there? Are we there yet? And you're going to get anxious and worried. If you can sit back, look at him, and have a descriptive praise of how faithful he is, it'll happen, and then you won't even realize it happened. Turn around and go, Thank you, Jesus. I'm healed. Man, Lord, you did that there. If the miracle surprised you, you're looking at the right place. Why? Because you weren't worried about what's happening. You were looking at him. Lord, we love you, Lord. Speak to us this morning in Jesus' name.